Welcome all you lovely people to another r slash pro revenge video. Our story of the day is by throwaway rev 2010. The best revenge is a happy life and having your cheating ex pay you child support. My revenge began with discovering my wife's infidelity. Let's call her Carrie. After 14 years of marriage and three kids, I saw a text appear on her work phone for just a few seconds that would forever change my life. It was a message that was sexually graphic and had no business being on anyone's work phone. It was on the lock screen and the sender's name was visible. Let's call him Perry. Background, I married Carrie when I was 25 and she was 22. I was teaching high school at the time and she was an RN. After having our first child, Carrie became a stay-at-home mom. Money was tight. So I took on an admin role in my department and coached two sports for the stipends. We made it, and after a few annual pay raises, I stopped coaching and took advantage of a program to earn an administrative credential. Once I made the jump to administration, our last child was ready for preschool, and Carrie decided she wanted to go back to work. Nursing jobs are always available, but they're not always the best positions. Carrie pretty much had to start back at the bottom, working alongside nurses that were a lot younger than she was and could work back-to-back -back double shifts that took a toll on Carrie. When she asked her supervisor about other positions, she was told that without a BSN, she wasn't going to move up. At the time, Carrie only had the two-year ADN. I told her that between preschool, after-school rec, and my retired mother, who was always willing to pick up the kids from school and watch them, I'd support her getting her BSN. It took her three years, but eventually she had her BSN and was promoted to a better position at the hospital. Things were good for a while. We had plenty of money, so we finally moved into our own McMansion, bought new cars, etc. I'd moved from school admin to the district admin, so I had more time to spend with Carrie and the kids. She was working a more predictable schedule, and even with my often long hours at work, this change allowed us to finally take vacations to all the places we'd put on a list during our honeymoon. She kept that list in our wedding album. At some point years later, I noticed she's carrying two phones with her. When I asked her about it, she said that it was a phone provided by the hospital. I didn't question her explanation because my district had also given me the option of a phone or a phone stipend, which I took instead. Again, months went by and I thought we were a happy, perfect family. I charged my phone in our den while she charged her phones in our guest bedroom that doubled as a computer room so we could keep tabs on the kids while they surfed the web. I was updating software on the computer when I saw a light around her work phone. She had a habit of always turning her phone's face down when charging them. Out of curiosity, I reached over to the phone and flipped it over. A message had popped up on the lock screen asking her when she'd like to be orally pleased again, but in much more graphic language. I also saw that Perry sent it. The world stopped around me. I just froze. My first thoughts were, what the heck was that about? It's her work phone. That kind of message gets people fired. Then it hit me. Was Carrie having an affair? It's amazing how the brain works. I suddenly started remembering a lot of things Carrie had done that seemed odd, but I'd either dismissed them myself or immediately accepted her explanation. She was always walking out of the room to answer a call or return a text and claimed that it would violate HIPAA if I overheard her talking about a patient. I accepted this because education has similar privacy laws regarding students. She would sometimes come home with the faint smell of cologne on her clothes and claimed it was from helping to move male patients. Again, I accepted this at face value, but it always struck me as odd how it seemed to be the same scent of cologne. Once the proverbial barn door was open, I started seeing a lot of things that I'd missed before. Our love life in the bedroom had cooled off considerably, which wasn't helped by her having to leave the house at odd hours to fill in for other nurses that called in sick. I also recalled where I'd seen the name Perry before, and a call to the hospital confirmed he was a doctor there. For the next week or so, I was walking around in a daze trying to put all of the pieces together. One of our kids had left a book in Carrie's car, so it was an excuse to visit the hospital. 
Carrie had told me personal visits were frowned upon. My kid went up to get Carrie's car key. I'd forgotten my key to her car at home. I talked to a nurse in the lobby and joked about how work phones seem like a blessing, but all they do is put you on call 24 hours a day. This led to her eventually telling me that the hospital was too cheap to give cell phones to nurses, so only high-level executives got them, which didn't include Carrie. With pretty much everything confirmed, I took some personal time off the next day to talk to a divorce lawyer. The news she gave me was horrible. We lived in a community property state with no-fault divorce. I made more money than Carrie, she'd been the primary caretaker of the kids, and we'd been married for more than 10 years. Basically, if I filed for divorce, I'd be screwed, lose the house, pay alimony, she'd get a huge chunk of my retirement, and I'd pay child support for the next decade unless I was lucky enough to be awarded joint custody. The worst thing she told me was that it didn't matter that she cheated. It didn't matter. I was crushed. There was only one person I could trust with this kind of information. She was a fellow teacher that had also made the jump to administration, but was stuck at a school site. Let's call her Anne. Anne had been married at 19, but her marriage was annulled when he got some other woman pregnant. Since then, she'd focused on her career, and we'd found we were kindred spirits in a lot of ways regarding K-12 education. I talked to Anne. She said something to me that changed my whole mindset. If you don't like the hand you're dealt, change the deck. I made more money than Carrie, and she had more time than me to be the primary caretaker of the kids. The second issue was actually kind of easy. At every district office, there's jobs that are fast tracks to higher positions, and there are jobs that administrators suffer through, like mess or KP duty in the military. One of these dead-end regulatory positions was open again. Ambitious administrators leave after a couple of years when a better position opens up. I sat down with our district superintendent and asked about being transferred to that position. At first he was shocked, but I told him that it was my time to take one for the team, and it would fill a hole in my admin experience. He agreed. It was really just crunching numbers with no personnel or student interaction, so I could set my schedule, even take a laptop home and work there. With my new free time, I began taking the kids to school, picking them up from school, not leaving them an after-school wreck or having my mother watch them, and taking them home. I'd help them with their homework, make dinner, etc. While the end goal was to become their primary caretaker, I can't explain how much I really, really enjoyed taking a more active role in their day-to-day -day lives. My salary hadn't been reduced, so I needed to find a way for Carrie to make a lot more money than she was in the current nursing position. I remembered Carrie being mad after she'd earned her BSN, and a supervisor told her, In the future, bachelor degrees will be worthless and everyone will need at least a master's degree. Carrie had worked hard to get her BSN, and that supervisor's comment pissed all over her hard work. I talked her into starting an MSN program. I told her that since I had a much more flexible work schedule, I would keep taking care of the kids. She was reluctant at first. Then I said, you could have every evening free to study or go to class, whatever you want to do. I saw her eyes immediately light up, probably thinking that she could spend more time with Perry. To make sure she was actually completing her MSN courses, I paid her tuition and fees directly to her university. It was going to take her between two and three years to finish. Those years were rough at times. I could tell every time she was rushing off or coming back from seeing Perry. There was an excitement or sense of satisfaction in her eyes that just wasn't there when she was doing her coursework. I had to either smile or pretend I didn't notice. My temper got short at times, and I found myself in arguments over petty nonsense. A couple of times, I almost blew the whole charade having to bite my tongue and apologize rather than scream insults at her that she deserved. Anne remained my confidant through all of this. I had recommended her for my previous fast-track position, and she joined me at the district office. Anne was qualified, hardworking, ambitious, and only needed her foot in the door to impress the higher-ups. I even got a few pats on the back for recommending her after she impressed everyone. 
Anne and I started our own affair. It wasn't some hot-blooded, passionate romance, but two friends giving each other what they need. Without Anne, I wouldn't have been able to maintain the charade of being the oblivious cuckold. But when Carrie would come home smiling after spending time with Perry, I was able to bear it, smiling back, because I had my own lover. After three and a half years, Carrie completed her MSN and was promoted at her hospital. Her salary went up substantially and was now higher than mine. When the kids and I made her a congratulations dinner, I made a joke about her being the breadwinner for the family, and she laughed, joking back I should be a stay-at-home dad now. A month later, I went back to the lawyer, who didn't remember me at first, and told her the financial situation had drastically changed. With these new facts, she drafted the petition and filed it. When the kids were with my mother, I had Carrie served. The deputy knocked on our front door, and I let him in, pointing at my wife. He asked her name and then handed her a copy of the divorce petition. With the deputy standing there, I told Carrie I knew all about her affair with Perry, but I didn't tell her how long I'd known. I told her to go be happy with her doctor lover. She screamed at me, tried to lie, and then made the mistake of rushing toward me. The deputy stopped her and warned her that women go to jail for domestic violence too. Now, he suggested she pack a bag to stay somewhere else. Carrie left after I promised not to tell the kids about her affair. I didn't tell the kids, but I told my mother, who told my sister, who told her kids, who told their cousins. My kids. It took a few days, but eventually the kids knew that dad was divorcing mom because she had a boyfriend. In the end, the court granted the divorce, giving me primary custody of our kids because I was already their primary caretaker. I kept the house with the promise I'd refinance to buy out Carrie's half. She was ordered to pay child support, and I used that fact to negotiate with her to give up any rights to my retirement if I bought her out. I was able to refinance my home, it was the era when banks threw money at everyone to buy or refinance a mortgage, and with a little money borrowed from my parents, I bought our Carrie's community property interest in the home and in my retirement. The day she signed all the paperwork with my lawyer, finally ending any possible financial obligations to her, was the happiest I'd ever been. I felt like I could finally breathe. I celebrated with Anne, who'd been my rock through all of it. I'm not ashamed to say that through the years, I'd cried many times in her arms. Anne and I would eventually marry. She got promoted to a higher position and I was convinced to take back my previous position at the district when my youngest child reached high school. Carrie and I got along well after the divorce. We took the kids to family therapy and worked out this co-parenting thing. For the first few months, she took a beating from the kids about why she needed a boyfriend when daddy was there all along. Between the kids and the therapist raking her over the coals, I didn't have to say anything at all. Carrie missed a lot of time with the kids because of her now legitimately busy work schedule, and I actually felt bad that my kids were missing time with their mother, so I encouraged them to talk to her on the phone instead. When Curry found out that I'd proposed to Anne, she congratulated me. I told her it's okay for her to marry Perry too. She got sad. She told me that Perry had started seeing another woman, a younger nurse at the hospital, because with her new position, she didn't have time for him and when they did get together, she wasn't fun anymore. My ex-wife, the woman who cheated on me and destroyed our marriage, was looking to me for sympathy. I had none to give. What I had was years of anger and frustration. Years of knowing some other man was sleeping with my wife. I'd lost weight from not being able to eat. I'd suffered hypertension and had to confide in my doctor why it wasn't the stress of my job. I had to listen to my dentist complain about how I was grinding and listening to him tell me I'd need dental implants if it kept up. There were times when I had to be intimate with Carrie to keep up the charade, fortunately infrequently, only to lie that I wanted to use condoms to remind us how we used to have sex when we were dating, or because I might have a bladder infection, then go take an STD test anyway and wait for the results before seeing Anne again. But in the end, it was all worth it. 
Sure, Carrie got a big payout when I bought her out of the house in my retirement, which she was trickling back to me through child support, but she lost everything else. Her kids only saw her every other weekend and spent a couple of holidays with her. Perry dumped her and he was no great catch anyway, since he was twice divorced with five kids and paying alimony and child support through the nose. I had kept my kids, my house, my income, my retirement, I got Anne, and I am genuinely happy. All in a community property state with no fault divorce. If that's not pro revenge, then I don't know what is. All I want to know from you guys is do you think putting up with that charade and waiting for the long con over two or three years, more of a psychopathic way to handle everything, or do you think it's more a realistic and practical thing to do in this situation? Let me know in the comments down below. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, and if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it. So until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.